And what do they do? They trusted me. They, they, they spoke to me about what I needed to do and they walked away and left me do it. They expected me to do it. And so I started to expect I could do it. And then suddenly I found I could. Hello and welcome to the Culture of Things podcast. I'm your host, Brendan Rogers, and this is episode 59. Today I'm talking with Rex Buckingham. Rex is on in Adelaide. Rex, how are you, mate? Good morning. All well, thank you down here, and hi to all. Great to see you, mate. We are today. Hopefully, we're we're streaming across YouTube. We've got that down pat. Uh, hopefully, we've now the LinkedIn and the Facebook side today as well. But we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. Rex, I'm going to read a little bit of your bio, and then uh, let's get into our conversation today. So, Rex has a substantial background in general management, marketing, manufacturing, finance, project management. HR personnel and strategic development at both the corporate, business owner, coaching and consulting level and across many industry sectors. He is the principal of Colour Thinking and Leadership Thinking Academy uh, and, and an active public speaker and trainer. Rex believes in the waterfall philosophy, which is change from the top. He delivers thinking and communication strategies that release the exponential power of the team re-engineering processes, policies, and thinking to implement sustainable change. Leadership-based thinking that empowers rather than controls. Rex says, I am not the solution, but the active observable facilitator. The focus of our conversation today is command and control leadership. Rex, welcome to the Culture Things Podcast. Good morning. Thank you. I'm looking forward to chatting with you. And mate, you are our first guest from Adelaide. Well, sorry, I should correct that. We did have Adam Crouch, our local MP, on many episodes ago. He was born in Adelaide, but doesn't reside in Adelaide anymore. So you're our first guest that actually is living in Adelaide. Congratulations. A big responsibility. <laughs> it's a massive one, mate. And you love your wine, I hear too, which is uh, Adelaide's a pretty That's good right. place for that. Yeah, come on down, try it out. <laughs> mate, you've been in uh, leadership. Uh, for about 40 plus years, I think it was. And today our topics can command and control leadership. And you know, we, we had a bit of conversation offline about that, which we can clarify during the conversation. But mate, I'd love for you, being in an industry like leadership and leadership thinking for 40 plus years, there must have been something that really triggered your interest a long time ago. Um, can you share that with us? What was it that sort of sparked your interest around leadership and going down this path and spending over 40 years in the in the industry. Okay, well, maybe if we start with uh, my personal story. And uh, so mum and dad put together some dollars and sent me off to a top school here in Adelaide. And uh, I was the most successful boy in the school at being the most unsuccessful. And in fact, I called myself an amoeba. Um, and this is sort of command and control uh, in as much as the first teacher didn't resonate with me or me with her and so the second teacher didn't and the third teacher didn't and so each teacher year year by year would tell tell the next teacher yes Rex he's, he's an okay sort of guy but not much happening upstairs and so um, I've, I've I've written the book which I've had here a moment ago I was going to show you and it's called it's called developed through leadership thinking and so what happened in that environment was Good people would tell other good people about Rex and what they could expect from him. <laughs> and what I, what I say often in my book, and I, I think about all the time, is that people live up to or down to expectation. And so I lived down to expectation every year, and I was completely successful at this capacity to be in the lowest stream, the lowest point of the lowest stream, year after year. Then I became successful at something else, and that was stuttering. And so when I turned about 13 and a half, 14, I developed this absolutely perfect stutter that didn't allow a second word to escape after the first word without at least four or five or six attempts. And so I became almost incoherent. And uh, that didn't do much for, for me in the family or me and my father who just saw me as an embarrassment. So my self-esteem really got kicked around in those first years. Somewhere in... Somewhere in my unsteady attitude about me, I found the, uh, 
I don't know what it was, to approach the headmaster and say to him, at the end of, of the year when I was still 14, because I turned 15 the next year, I'm not quite sure this is working for me. That would have taken about 10 minutes. Um, and I think it would be good if I perhaps left school and went and did something else. And he agreed. So I went home and told mum and dad, and they agreed. And so I didn't start uh, what was known as year uh, 10 back in those days. Uh, I went to work. and So that's the control part of that was good people telling other good people what their conclusion was and no one saying, is that the only conclusion or what else could we do to find something in this boy? So I applied for a job at a company called Woolworths. You may have heard of them. They sell groceries and things. And uh, there was 32 of us and I lined up on this Terrazzo stairway, one of 32. They only wanted one boy and they hired me a boy with no schooling uh, capacity, no sporting capacity, and couldn't speak, and they hired me. And um, I can pretty much say within six weeks, my stutter had gone. And in that first six, six weeks, the manager said to me, Rex, you're going to need to get some schooling. Now, I know your parents have spent tens of thousands of dollars, but that hasn't worked. And so I suggest you go down and do some night school. So I did, went down and did some night school, I missed an entire year. I just missed it to the following year without just missing a year. And I was fourth to top in the class, working each day at Woolworths, studying after hours. I went from being at the bottom and the fourth level to the top of the class, missing an entire range. So maybe Rex wasn't the dud that he had been proven to be. Now, my metamorphosis was leadership. And that's the answer to your question. That's why I am so... Um, devoted to the concept of moving people out of command and control into leadership. And a lot of that stems to the to people live up to or down to expectations. And when you expect something of me, then I begin to expect that of me. And so I don't look for anything else. So my personal experience, I mean, I don't know where I'd be today if it hadn't have been for the way those people dealt with me back when I was 15. And I'm 73 now, so that was a fair while ago, maybe even more than 40 of those years you spoke of. So that, <laughs> that might put it in some context. Like, what did they see in you? Did they ever give you feedback about what they saw in this 15-year-old lad that was, uh, you know, Failing in education, I guess you could say the traditional education, but they saw something in you. What was that? Failing in life. I hadn't, I didn't, when you have no self esteem, you have no friends. You, you have nothing going for you. Uh, I mm. asked him, I asked John, the manager, uh, about six months after I started. And he said, Rex, of the boys who applied, there was not a single boy there who needed it more than you did. And what did they do? They trusted me. They, they, they spoke to me about what I needed to do and they walked away and left me do it. They expected me to do it. And so I started to expect I could do it. And then suddenly I found I could. One of the things my father gave me was energy. And one of the things my father gave me was the capacity not to deal with can't and, and no and but and try and hope, you know, to get out there and do it. And it's, I suddenly had a, an environment where I could do that. I became the I became the youngest manager in the history of Woolworths. In fact, I, I became a manager of a store when I was not yet 18 and they couldn't give me the key because the insurance policy wouldn't allow for me to have the key. So I had to give it to my 56-year-old too, I see, <laughs> to let me in. <laughs> but, but, and so that I think I became pretty obnoxious, actually, Brendan. I think I came from being the anima to this, this all... I think I became very command and control. I think it was Rex's way or the highway, to be quite honest. And uh, I was lucky to have some leaders. I, was, I had leaders all through my corporate life who steadied me, who didn't stop me, uh, who didn't control me, but just used good language to steady me, to ask me questions for me to reflect upon myself. That was hugely helpful uh, to me. So... Um, all of my energy now, well, at 73, I'm still working because I love it, but I'm, I'm focused on youth suicide and I'm focused on domestic violence 
And I believe a lot of that comes through people leaving work, feeling unappreciated, feeling uh, 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 not included. So they, they, they leave work with a, a mindset of uh, a deficit mindset and they walk back into their environment and all that's left is negativity. And as you know, negativity breeds negativity. So leadership, I believe, has a huge amount to do with uh, mental health uh, and and just calmness within within life. Hmm. You might ask me the difference between command and control and leadership. Mate, we're certainly going to unpack that now. And, and I, I've already written in some of my preparation that we will unpack a little bit about the your interest in youth suicide and domestic violence, mental health matters, because I know it's a passion of yours. Um, but I do want you to unpack this command and control leadership because you and I had a conversation over LinkedIn around command and control leadership and I gave you a, a, a reason why I framed the title of this conversation command and control leadership but you were very quick to point out to me command and control and leadership are very different things tell us a bit about that buddy either end of the continuum <clears throat> the first thing is I guess we are taught command and control from before we are born. When we're laying there quietly in, in all the fluid, just being looked after by mum, if we want, if we feel like moving our arm, even though mum hasn't slept for 15 hours, we just move our arm and we kick our leg and we wake it up again. You know, we, we learn selfishness, we learn self-centeredness, we learn command and control. And then we get taught to, to, be, to, to show command and control, to be leaders, to... to to, to tell people what to do, to follow me. You know, that comes with school. It comes with sport. You know, it comes with a lot of examples. So we get taught to take charge. And the trouble with taking charge is it means you don't get a chance to participate. Your job is to follow me. So I'm a good leader because you follow me. So command and control is not about, it's not about bad people. It's not about bad energy. It's just about habits that, uh, that are applauded uh, in early days. Um, and so command and control or command in the first place is, uh, and, and I spent a year in Vietnam uh, as part of national service and, you know, and there's the argument, well, command and control is important in the army because if, if you're about yeah. to go over the hill to fight the enemy, it's not a good time to have a powwow. <laughs> Should we do it? <laughs> Should we come from the left? You know, but follow me is, is, is appropriate. So command and control is appropriate, but what's missing is, is ownership. If I own it all, if I own all the thinking, if I own all the information, and I just give you jobs out of that, then that's not leadership. Because, because you don't know why you're doing the jobs. You, you go home at the end of the day having done seven jobs. You might have done seven jobs through your will, but you don't know what, how you participated in the growth uh, of the business, how, how, you, how you met the organizational uh, outcomes. And so command is important in as much as if I was dealing with you, Brendan, and we're looking at doing some, some sort of work together, in the first place, I would share with you some sort of overview. And by, by, by sharing the overview with you, I bring you into the picture. I don't own the overview and tell you my conclusions out of it. I bring you into the overview, not for you to come on board. That's command and control is, I give it to you to go and do. Leadership is... I give it to you so you can come on board and add your thoughts. I have this thing. It's a, it's a, a little formula. One plus a number should equal greater than the sum of the number. Now, you've probably heard that. It's been around a long, long time. I didn't invent it. But if I share with you, I sort of know what I know. I never know what I know. I just sort of know what I know. I don't know what I know until I investigate it, until I audit it, until I check it out. But I'm, I share with you and you get the bit I give you and you make your conclusion about that. And then if I'm open and you share it back with me, I now know more than I knew before. One plus one equals greater than just me. When you share your information with me, I now know more and I can audit your information. So out of what you say, can a whole new idea be bought? I've been, I've been, uh, I spent the first 12 years in corporate management and then I started my own business on the birth of my son 43 years ago. And um, what I found was in that time, particularly in, I, I, my business was recruitment, coaching, 
consulting and mentoring was I almost never was given a brief that ended up being what I would do. Almost always people wanted me to solve effects and didn't have, didn't have much time to think about what the cause of the effects was. And so I'm, I'm talking about this through command and leadership here. My leadership of a client will be to say thank you. Now, let's have a look at where that's coming from. If I come in and solve that problem for you, it will be a problem again because we haven't addressed the, the cause. And I'd lose jobs sometimes because the, the owner would say, no, 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 I want you to come and fix this up. Well, okay, I, I might come and fix that up for you, but part of that's going to be fixing up what's happening. So my leadership was to the client to help them come on board. But it wasn't ownership. It was asking leading questions for the client to develop their perspective for the client to get out of their paradigm of what is possible and what isn't possible, what's been tried before. See, what I found early on was if we got to a point where there was a strategy, you may have heard this, this statement, that's been tried before. That would never work in this industry. Have you ever heard those statements? A few times. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, they're just habit conversations that come out to slow slow or stop. And so leadership is not being put off the objective by conversations that would seem to put off the objective. So as, as in my leadership way with a client, I need to, I need to understand that's their, that's their scary point. That's their, that's their point of rebuttal. I'm going to need to move around that. So in some ways, that is a little bit of command and control in as much as I'm not just being there to receive, but I'm there to get to a point. And the point was to loosen up your mind so we could have a one-on-one -on -one conversation rather than me owning the conversation, which I seem to be doing right now. It's your job to own the conversation right now, ah, mate. Right. <laughs> so well, perfectly fine. So long as we know that. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to get on fine then. <laughs> this is a, it's, it's more of me being the active listener in this, uh, in this occasion <laughs> and, and extracting as much information from you as possible. <laughs> yeah. So, so, so sometimes people are seen command and control. People, a friend of mine spoke to a fellow called Dick Smith. He, that, might, that may be a name you know also. And like I say, it was that loud. And I, I, and I hope Dick's not listening. <laughs> but he, he was asked to come in and give a hand because a lot of his executives didn't show much in the way of initiative. Mm. And so my mate said, well, can I come and sit in on a, an exec meeting? And he said, sure. And at the end of the meeting, he said, uh, boy, you're so powerful. I mean, you're so powerful. You know so much. You, you, your brain's just going all the time. I mean, you, it's amazing. But Dick, there's no space for anyone else to participate. You know, so one plus a number equals greater than the sum of the number, only if you give the number a chance to speak. Mm. And so the leadership thing is you don't have to know. You made the comment earlier. Uh, a dictum I have yeah. is, as the leader, I am not the solution. Gather around and listen to me and, and get all my wisdom. <laughs> no, no, what's your wisdom? I want to know what you have to think. One plus a number is part of that, and I am the solution, not the so I am the facilitator, not the solution, is a very big part about it. So part of part of our time together today is I want to help people who have somebody who is command and control, do it, go and do this, come back and see me when you're finished doing this. And they want to help that person become more inclusive, more connected with maybe that individual who's listening right now. This, this idea of facilitation rather than solution is really important. This idea of one plus one plus a number is very important. And uh, a bit later on today, I'll explain how they can use that, uh, how they can manage up. Mm -hmm. You see, it's, we don't have to go home and spend our time complaining about our boss. We don't have to sit around having coffee complaining about our boss. And it's just a condition of life. A lot more fun in negativity than there is in positivity. If I was sitting in a group of six people and they were all complaining about Brendan and his command and control, and I said, well, hang on a second, what can we do? I wouldn't get an invite to coffee again because it's just not popular. 
Now, the blame is popular, the fault is popular, so long as it's being pushed out at somebody else. There's a fellow called Abraham Maslow who talks about this, but we might have to save that for another day because <laughs> we've already had <laughs> 20 minutes of fun with Rex. <laughs> <laughs> Mate, it, 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 once again, a, a number of things to unpack. But we, ju we did have a comment in the uh, on the live stream, just to, more of a comment rather than a question. But just from Julie, it's stronger than my excuses. Amazing what happens when someone believes in you. So again, just reiterating that point. I guess someone believed in you at Woolies as a fifteen-year-old kid, and look where it's taken to you that that journey. So um, thanks for your yeah. comment, Julie. Um, Thank you, Julie. Julie, that's really important what you just said. When I was writing the book. I was thinking about when I was 15 and why I didn't take more ownership of who I, who I wasn't or who I was, both those things, in fact. And I came to the conclusion that when you have no self-esteem, you have no pathway. You are just at the end of the path and you just are there to receive whatever comes down because that's the expectation. So I don't know where I got it that I go and talk to the headmaster, what what came out of the sky for that one, but the previous 12 years or 10 years, I, I had no self-esteem, so I had no authority. I was just there to receive. And uh, so it's a, it's a good pickup, Julie. Just on that, Rex, I mean, you're a, and I say this very, very respectfully, you're an old style leadership sort of guy. Like when I've done research on, you know, you're not a big fan of you know profiling and those sorts of things and 360 feedback process and stuff like that like what's the you know I, I love that style mind you like what what is that thing that resonates for you through your 40 years like what's what's this powerful thing that's made you sort of not shun these things i know you're not shunning them completely but you know there's an old style to you that i think is maybe missing in leadership today, we are we're focused on the the new bell and whistle and bring this sort of thing in. And you know, is there something in your whole mindset about what the value yeah. of this, what I respectfully say, old style leadership? Yeah. Um, so I started with Woolworths, spent two years in national service, came back out. Woolworths had changed from very much a um, we rely on you to think and show initiative and run the business. In the two years of the way, they they went to com complete command and control, and the the job of the manager was to sit by the, uh, the 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 post box and wait for the edicts coming out of head office about what they would do, where they would put product, what displays they would have, how they would think, what time to go to the toilet. I mean, it was just horrendous. <laughs> so I left, and uh, I went to work for General Motors Holdings, and I, I had five jobs in corporate. I had no experience in any of the industries that I ever went into. And I had five managers who just said, Rex, get on and do it. Let's sit down and work out what it is we want to achieve, what our objectives are, what our KPIs are, not these are your KPIs, what our KPIs are. And if you don't agree with it, or if you think it's a bit lopsided, I mean, one of the KPIs I got when I was working as a state manager of a finance company, with no education, state manager of a finance company, was uh, that they had a, had, a, had a KPI on growth, but they had no KPI on margin. So I said, you better give me a KPI on margin or I'm going to get growth and it's going to cost you money. You know, so my dad's don't think about can't and no and hope and, 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 and trust yourself. When I found a way of trusting myself, I found myself to be maybe contrarian. I didn't find it embarrassing to say to somebody, well, you thanks for that. Can we look at it from this point of view? Right? And I had people who weren't scared of one of their employees not just standing there and taking it. See, in command and control, I come and I give you an instruction and you say yes and I pretend you agree and I pretend you're going to go and do it knowing you're not. You go around the corner and you stand at the coffee shop or you stand at the water cooler and you tell all the others in the area what a dope I am and it's not going to work. And then I, then I, then I, I, I kill the strategy because it's the wrong strategy. No, it wasn't the wrong strategy. It was the implementation. 
I use command and control to implement it by telling someone directly, go and do this. Mm-hmm. I have no idea what they understood out of my conversation. We have this wonderful question. Do you understand? And people say yes. We have no idea what they understand. <laughs> All we know is we've just disconnected ourselves from them and sent them off into the into the wilderness. <laughs> Mate, you made you made reference to the army around command and control, and again, one of the people on the line uh, actually has a son in the army. I guess using that as an example, but I want to bring that back into the corporate space. Is there a is there a place for this command and control? I know you made some reference earlier, but I guess the thing that comes into mind is, say, crisis management situations. Where, you know, where there's time pressures, would that be a place where there's a command and control type of approach? would be more suitable? I've just been working with the managing director of a 500-employee company, manufacturing company, and he kept saying to me, so, Rex, when can I use command and control? Because you know, he'd come up through the ranks, and he was always and, – and this happened to me when I came at Woolworths. I was a little counter boy, and I, I grew up to be the, the manager, and my obnoxiousness was – I was wanting to be the person who was in charge, who was the solution, because that's that was what I was sort of thought it was all about. Um, so command and control has a place in the example you just gave. Edward de Bono says, with the benefit of hindsight, well, when you're developing a strategy to suit what you were just talking about, you develop the strategy and you do that cooperatively. Not as not consensus, never consensus, cancer consensus, worst out- outcome. But you do it collaboratively. You listen to each other. You sound each other out. You test each other. You are respectful, but you just don't. You just don't follow. And then you come up with the strategy. Well, now the strategy can be can be command and control because it's been grown by the value of the people. Like we all own it. Like the 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 major could be saying over the hill as much as the private, because we've, we've all got the pattern down that we agreed was the pattern. And so we mustn't keep looking for ways to be in charge and own outcomes. We've got to look, be, be uh, we have, keeping in mind that 80% of the clients I had, I have today, don't ask me to do the job I need to do. The lead, the manager often doesn't know what they actually have to do, they just know they've got to, they think they've got to get to a certain point. I'm working with a client now who hired me to grow their business. And I did that for four years. And I, the other day I sat down and I said, okay, our chore now is to grow it back. Because you've got to a stage now where you're going to have to increase your business by 25% to make the same amount of money because you're going to have to increase your, your staff and your turnover. You made more money when you were slightly smaller. And you had time with your family, so let's let's redevelop the business back because bigger isn't always better. You know, let's find the, it's called the sweet spot where you get to know you have children, and you're not looking at the, the, to increase your overdraft. Mm. Yes, yeah, so there is places of command and control, but we don't we don't. It's not the, it's not the first place we go to, and and I know. I mean, because I'm. Because I, I have I have had this wide experience, Brendan. I know some stuff. You know, whilst I've been consulting, I've started up four businesses from from start to scratch. So, and in my coaching and in my consulting and, and, and in my teaching, I'm testing my thinking all the time. I only hang out with people who argue with me. If, if we ha- if, if you came over to Adelaide to try our wine, Brendan, and we sat down and you and you agree with me the whole way through a meal. I probably wouldn't book you to have lunch with the next day. <laughs> you better disagree with me. <laughs> so, so command and control, there's a place for it. Uh, command and control helps to get clarity, but the clarity has got to be of the people, of the, of the number of people, because it's the number of people who are going to make the strategy fail or succeed, not just Rex in all his magnificence. It'll be Rex and the group of people who are all being listened to and all being connected to and all being included with. That's how strategies survive. Mm. I did this um, webinar for the Association of Strategic Planning, a world webinar, and I did a a webinar for Project Management Institute of South Australia. And in those two environments, they told me roughly 
rough figures, 70% of strategies fail. 70% of projects never meet the stated outcome, like 70%. And they were saying, why is it? Well, because people walk around telling people what to do. And people walk around not listening. You know, so bring, don't work out. And people, people hold meetings, Brendan. People hold, so, so just for a moment, I mean, I, I don't know you very well, but you seem like you're quite a nice guy. But say you wasn't, say, say your behaviour was obnoxious. You wouldn't get invited to the next meeting. So I would ex exit you from the meeting because I'll talk to people who talk my language. Well, why bother talking to them? We already have that language. The language I need is the person who's showing obnoxious behaviour. And I'm blaming that person because I'm command and control. Well, leadership is, hang on, what can I do to connect with Brendan? Because mm -hmm. I'm going to need Brendan on my side out there in the field because he's either going to sabotage me or he's going to make it work. Mate, we're going to, we are going to move on to, again, one of the ladies in the live stream, Sonia, talked about the loving the idea of moving command and control type people over to being leaders. We're going to unpack that topic in a minute. But what I want to just go back to is that sense of, I guess, what I call healthy conflict. And, you know, surrounding yourself with people that have different perspectives on things, because ultimately, again, that meets the formula of, of bringing, you know, what you know, you know, what they know, bring that together and know more that more that we know together. Um, that phrase, intelligent disobedience that I saw in some of the, the work that you've written about and done. Can you unpack that a bit? What does that actually mean? And how does that fall into surrounding yourself with uh, the people that uh, have conflicting yeah. views? You would have heard of groupthink. Yeah, I've come across it from time to time. <laughs> yes, 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 it's a flood. It's a flood. Command and control makes it unsafe for me to say something, and so it's safer to say what you, what I think it is you want me to mm. say. So you never find out what it is I think, and you pretend you agree with me. Okay, so, so command. So, so groupthink is the cancer because I've got six people in my executive committee i've got 17 people on the production line and i'm and i'm and i'm the i'm the uh, the the um supervisor and i'm pretending to hold a, a meeting with them and i'm doing it at a command and control way not working because they don't dare say anything i've got a couple of case studies i might be able to squeeze in um so groupthink means that we don't get to hear what you think but the other half of that is you don't get to hear what you think because you never get a chance to say it so you just walk away thinking negatively to whatever I have sent. That's group think. Then there's preemptive think. Uh, I asked Brendan a month ago about this, and he just pushed me away. So I won't bother asking him again. I preempt even the question by the thought that you're going to be negative to it. So that's a huge amount of the energy out there. Intelligent disobedience, which I only really came across about six months ago, and I'm, I'm now interacting with the with the author of the book, um, is where you, by using emotionally intelligent language, connect with a person who is disconnecting from you by their behaviour. So you find a way of, of coming back in and getting a moment in the sun where they'll actually receive your information. And you're, you're doing it intelligently. You're not doing it disruptively. You're not doing that because you feel hurt or emotional. It's not an emotional outburst. It's a thoughtful process where I say, okay, Brendan, and this is a bit more of De Bono, a bit more of Maslow. Um, Brendan, I heard what you're saying and I, I, I get it. Could we just have a look at it from another perspective? Right, so. I beg your uh, approval to talk to you by showing you the respect of not dismissing. See, the trouble is we use emotional language. Yeah, I heard what you said, Brendan, but th that'll never work. I heard what you said, Brendan. We, we tried that before you came in here as MD. You know, we, we push people away wondering why they push us away. So if you want to get that moment in the sun, we've got to learn language. And I, I write about this in the, in the book change our sentences you change a sentence and you change a life and so if i'm having a problem with you i can blame you i can find you at fault you're a you're a command and control you're a bad leader I don't even like you and i can go home but tell my wife and my family i have the golf course i've got this horrible person i work for 
or I can change my sentence and I can take responsibility. So when when um, Sonia is talking about uh, uh, moving command and control people to leadership, it's about me moving them, not them moving. My responsibility. And, and I can do that even when I feel downtrodden, even when I've tried four or five times to do it and it hasn't worked. I can do it if I look at the way I start the conversation. And if I start the... Have you ever heard the statement, I have tried everything? Have you ever heard that statement? Yep. Yeah. I bet they haven't. I bet they've tried the same thing 15 times. <laughs> That's my experience, at least, or maybe a shades of the fit. But no. Take responsibility, stop fault and blame, change your sentence, and your life changes. I say in the book, if you're going to have coffee with someone that you have coffee with regularly and you you know you're not you're gonna it's gonna be boring or it's gonna be you're gonna leave and you've just lost an hour, either don't go and have coffee with them or change your introductory sentence when you first see them. That's leadership. Because I want to get a different outcome. I don't want to blame you. I don't want to waste my hour. But I, I, I want to like you. Like you, you are my mother. You know, I should have a better relationship with you. And this is this applies to mums and dads and brothers and sisters as much as it does colleagues and friends. I can change anything in my life by changing my sentence. And so that's coming back to leadership. And so moving people from one behaviour to another is about how I do it. And it's about the responsibility I take. And it's when I sit down in the cafeteria or the coffee bar and I don't just listen to everybody else reaching on about somebody, but I actually say, well, I don't want to be part of that conversation. I want to actually own a capacity to move it forward. So I go home each day feeling like I've contributed, I'm a worthwhile person and I deserve my space. Then when I walk in and I see my kids and my and my and my partner, my wife, my husband, whatever, I've got I can be gracious, I can be loving, uh, I have time and I have space and respect for myself. And so I've got space to listen to you. I don't have to become annoyed and frustrated and angry because we mums and dads do a lot of command and control. Absolutely. Mate, you again talked about moving and your language and help you help how you help a person move from this command and control into leadership. Can you talk more about that? Yeah, I can. It's, it's complex in its simplicity. Um, maybe I can just share this um, very quick case study. A client of mine's wife's sister was being bullied badly at work. She was a nurse bullied badly and she went to HR about it and the bullying got worse and she went to her manager's manager and the bullying got worse. Over two years it became almost unbearable but she had that thing in her head that she didn't want to quit. She would, she would vomit in the car park before going in, such was the anxiety in her body. Eventually, my client's wife said to her sister, go and see Rex. She changed her life the next day, almost four years ago, with one sentence. And the other four people in that pod who, who responded to that particular nurse still had every day serious command and control, depreciating behaviour. But this girl, black to white, and it was as simple as one sentence, one sentence. But when she took responsibility for changing it and she moved out of the mindset of it's hopeless, this is just how this person is. Boy, how many times have I heard this? That some poor little child being manufactured fourth month of in, in the womb is coming out an angry person or a bully or a, a bad person. <laughs> I don't believe it. You know, maybe there's that much uh, about hereditary and stuff, but most of it's about environment, I believe, about expectations. So you can change most things by the sentence you use. But the trick is not hanging out with people who are committed to not finding a way. 
one plus a number should equal greater than the sum of the number. And so if people around you are convincing you that it's hopeless, then people live up to or down to expectations and it will be hopeless. And it won't be my fault because that's the kind of person they are. So it's a sentence. So the sentence I gave this person was, and I, I said to her, there's three potential ways this person is going to receive your sentence. They will tear up almost halfway through your sentence or they'll say something structural like, if you could get those reports to me before 5 p.m. on Tuesday rather than the first thing Wednesday morning, it would make my life so much easier because quite often people just don't tell people what they need. They just get bitchy with each other. Uh, or she may, she may just go into a rant. But the rant thing, 5, 6, 7, 10% chance. 80% chance would tear up. So she said she, she went, she, she sought an sort of, uh, interview with her manager and she said to her, it strikes me that I must have done something wrong. I need you to tell me what I need to do differently so we can work as a team. So she took all the energy away from the person. See, we get taught to say things like, if only you didn't do this, I wouldn't do that. You make me feel. We have so many negative sentences that we put out there and put out there and put out there, which just substantiates the blame and the guilt and the fault and the right and the wrong. You know, well, it seems to me that I must have done something wrong. Please, you need to tell me what it is so I can fix it. And she didn't even get to the, so I can fix it. And the woman starts to have tears coming down her, her eyes. And her response was, I'm not really a bitch. But my, the frustration is my manager is so difficult. So you, she used that sentence on her manager. Such a great sentence and, and just disarming well, the know, whole conversation, isn't it? So really putting the responsibility on yourself. It takes away that blame thing. Mm. So if, if anybody here listening right now wants to make an effect on the person that they are um, working with because they don't feel like they're connected with, they're not invited to the meetings they should be, they're not getting uh, the, the right career uh, uh, um, pathways. Uh, if anything about it is, makes them feel depreciated uh, and they want to change that, then they have to change it. The, the person is doing this is not going to wake up one morning and say, oh, oh no, what am I doing each day? I must be nicer to Brendan. It doesn't work that way. It's me and you and I'm going to find a way, my responsibility. And so Stop talking to the people who tell you it's, it's impossible and uh, maybe give me a buzz. If you buy my book, <laughs> you get an hour with me for nothing. Can you imagine an hour with me? Oh, maybe five minutes with me might be enough, okay. But sometimes if you just need to talk to somebody and it may not be the people, it probably isn't the people you go to normally. It may be somebody that you admire. It might be the local grocer who's always positive. Just somebody you're going to dare to share because you're going to dare to believe you can make your life better. Not dare to think, how can I go to work tomorrow and survive? I'm going to make my life better. And it'll be about a sentence and it'll be about complete lack of guilt. I don't know if it's an Australian thing. Mark might be able to tell us uh, with his Canadian background, but we seem to be able to give compliments to people and then put at the end of the sentence like a little negative. Oh, Brendan, you know, I see you, you got the work done on time. Never thought it would happen. <laughs> we just seem to. Yeah. That is that, that's that passive aggressive yeah. comment. <laughs> passive aggressive, yes, yes, yeah. I, I give it and I take it away. And all the, all the, all the, all the, all the person getting it gets mm -hmm. the takeaway. You know, it's slap across the face for having done a good thing. It's, so, First, look at ourselves. Second, don't take notice of people who say it's not possible. Third, look at some other ways of approaching a conversation that doesn't include blaming the other person <clears throat> for what's happening. The blame and the fault, the right and the wrong, the good and the bad, there's just no space for it. Be a little self-depreciating. Make it possible and safe for the other person to talk to you. They don't have to jump over a hill first. You, you expose yourself, dare to, 
dare to expose mm. yourself. And 80% of the time, you'll be rewarded. And, and I'm serious when I say, give me a call, tell me what you did. We'll have a chat on the phone. Not, no problem, no charge. You know, I'm, I'm, you know I, when I turned 50, uh, I had a reversal in my life and I lost all of my financial capacity and two kids at school. Um, uh, I would had the wife in that company I had at the time. We had no work, no house, no car, no, no nothing. <laughs> happy, happy 50 Rex. And, um, and so I say what I say with a lot of energy because uh, we, we, when COVID wasn't here, we pop around the world once a year for six weeks and have a, have a nice time because we, we rebuilt our life. And I, I hang out with positive people. I hang out with people who are doing things, who are not working out. who are not always bitching and complaining about life. You know, and that's my leadership of me. I put myself in those positions. And so in, in, to, to talk a little bit more about uh, what you can do to help your manager act with you differently is you need to act differently. You need not to assume they're going to act with you in a certain way. You need to give them the benefit of the doubt. And if they answer you in one of their habitual ways, because we all have these habitual comments that we just spit out all the time, if they give you one of those habitual answers, which you could probably write down before they gave it to you, then you just need to say, well, thank you for that. But can we have a look at like this? We just need to stay stay sound and stay calm, stay in the conversation and stay respectful and expect it to work. Expect it to work. Don't expect it not to work because you'll be right. You might as well be right on the expecting it to work. Mm. That word vulnerability, you didn't mention it, but it's coming through loud and clear, mate. Being Making yourself vulnerable in these situations makes a big difference. What? A, what... Yeah. And it, it does take, it does take courage. If I'm a leader who has lived and learnt to live in this command and control space, but let's say I've seen the light through whatever reason, what risks do I have? Are there any risks associated with me making a change and trying to make a change to move myself from command and control to you know this more leadership style that we refer to? Yeah. So leadership style is about connecting, connecting. Connecting is about asking. And asking is about listening. And listening is about asking. And asking is about listening. And listening is about asking. A-L-A-L-A. -L -L -A. That's, that's how we connect with people. Not ask, listen, tell. Because there is a real desire to, yeah, thanks for that, but, you know, okay. So... The potential perceived deficit in exposing yourself to look like you are asking people is that some people will say, don't you know? Or you will think they will think you don't know. And all they'll be thinking is, what's happened to him? What's happened to her? What's she doing asking me? And they won't trust you at first. If you've been very heavy command and control, they won't trust you at first. Their, their habit of response to what do you think will be, it's not my job. I don't know, because that's their habit response to your habit conversation. So the habit, I'll be as unuseful to you as you let me be. So if I dare to ask you, as you, I think you were heading at, if I dare to be looking at changing my style and I'm daring to connect with you and I push you away, it's self-fulfilling. I'll go back to how I used to be. And you will say that I I have disconnected from you, but you have disconnected from me. And you can have all the you can have all the reasons in the world to support why you shouldn't shouldn't trust me. Now you can you can fifteen pages of reasons why you shouldn't trust me. But if that's if your objective is to be trusted, well then you wasted your time with the fifteen pages. Just work out. Expect to be acknowledged. Expect to be connected. So my. I've seen it happen in um, in executive because I used to own a recruitment company. I've seen managing directors say about their executive committee, "I don't talk to them; they're too consultative. They never know what to do. They've always got to ask somebody else." And I'll say to the managing director, "So how many of your strategies fail?" Oh, it's very difficult. <laughs> Why don't you shut up? <laughs> Why don't you just shut up and ask people? And when they when they dare. 
Have you ever been to the the Brisbane the show, or the Sydney Certainly Agricultural have. I grew show up in Brisbane? In the shot in the sideshow area, there's a um, uh, a, a sideshow which involves ducks and rifles. I love it. Can you picture <laughs> that one? You love it. Okay. So what happens? They're the not live up, ducks. And your let, job let is to... Say, they're not live ducks. <laughs> oh, no, yes. yes. Absolutely. No, no metal duck was hurt <laughs> in the demonstration. No. <laughs> yes. yes. Oh, well, 15, 15 <laughs> comments came in. Leave those ducks alone. <laughs> well, that's the answer. Leave the ducks alone. So what happens is in the sideshow, up comes the duck and we shoot it down. If we're not careful in command and control behaviour, I pretend to ask you a question because I don't really respect you because you never show any initiative because I never let you show the initiative. So you, you squeak out a bit of an answer and I shoot you down. I pick up my rifles and that wouldn't work, Brendan. Not in the budget, haven't got the staff, check out the comment. I've, I've got 15 different Howard answers to prove that your idea is wrong. I shoot you down. And then I say, nobody dares to talk to me. No, no, I don't get any initiative. I don't, no one participates. Well, you know, you, I've got a hole in my head here, my left eye's been shot out, my, I've got to <laughs> shut up my nostril. I'm, you know. A damaged and duck, Rick. It's not very damaged people. duck. <laughs> well, that's why they move them on, you see. They, <laughs> but that, that's the thing. The thing is that um, it's, it's difficult to move out of the safety of being the boss at, at any level. And, and, and it is, interestingly enough, command and control can happen from the floor up. When I, when I got the job with Woolworths, Little Rex Amoeba started to grow. And there was a woman, who I'm sure has passed away by now, who was on the switchboard, because I'm old, 73. Like, we didn't have computers, you know. We barely had phones, you know. There was a can with a string between it. She was on the switchboard. And I had to go past her to get to my office. And she had a look. I would go around the back way and up the stairs to go to my office rather than go past her look. And she controlled the head office, this switchboard operator. She wasn't... She was a switchboard operator, but she didn't lack intelligence and she had some excellent ideas. And the managing director could sometimes be heard to be talking to her, <laughs> sounding out ideas. <laughs> but command and control can come from behaviour, can come from uh, um, just attitude, can come from uh, just a perspective, and it can come mm -hmm. under you, up to you, or on top of you, or across the peer groups. But it's us who allow it. Whatever I'm getting, I'm allowing. And the challenge is, I don't know how to change it. So I let it be. So I have a manager saying to me, oh, no, look, um, Rex hasn't, Rex is not, not performing. How long has he been performing? Oh, six months. So you've been paying him to come to work for six months, not performing. So who's not performing? <laughs> Sounds like you're not performing. <laughs> you know, yeah, often happens in bullying situations. Oh no, that's just how they are. But you pay them. There's a thing called duty of care. You know, it's a psychologically safe workplace. But you pay them to come to work to bully. Well, no, I don't. We should do. But all that's missing is a strategy, because people say. That person is a bully. That's the direction. That person is a bully. Not that person has bullying behaviours. That's leadership. Management mm -hmm. is that person's a bully. He's a box, pop him in, bully. Leadership is he's a person with behaviour. Why, why is that person behaving like that? What can we do to change that behaviour? Yeah. So Very real a different mindset perspective. shift, which is important. Linking the where you, you've taken that and I guess even referring back to our damaged duck uh, respectfully and linking it to your passion of mental health. What, what's the impact? You used an example earlier in our conversation around somebody who'd made some you know changes to their own mindset, but what, what are some of the impacts of people uh, within a com command and control type environment on their own mental health? What have, what have you seen out there? Well, <sighs> uh, 
<laughs> I can be contentious. <laughs> I think the labels use way too much. Um, I think the, la the autistic label is used way too much. It, 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 it's full of fault and blame. It's full of things outside our control that we're managing. And, and, and my um, experience is that they are outcomes of behaviours of other people. <clears throat> very much outcomes of people live up to or down to expectations. So if I think you're going to be difficult, if I think you're going to be rude in a supermarket, you probably will be rude in a supermarket. And it sure as hell wasn't my problem. You must be autistic. So I think a lot of it is we are a bit eggshell egg prone. Don't don't say that to them. No, no, no. Be careful. There's laws against that, that can be bullying. A whole lot of eggshell stuff, which is totally unhelpful. Daniel Goleman writes about emotional intelligence and emotional intelligence is a really good concept and it's about clarity. It's about respect, honesty and clarity. It's about care, but it's not about shielding yourself from potential um, impacts by someone taking, um, not liking what you said. It's about having difficult conversations carefully, but having them. That's leadership. Yeah, not managing the person out because you couldn't fix them because you never told them what was wrong. I've, 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 I've spoken to people after they've been through performance management discussions and they have no idea what happened. And I can guarantee you the thing that didn't happen was the person doing the performance management didn't never told them what it was they had a problem with. But now by some sort of magical situation, that person's going to go away and be better. Well, I don't even know what it was they weren't being good at, you know, so... The fear of some people moving away from command and control is I'm finding it hard enough to run the business right now. I'm hard enough to get these salesmen to do what they're supposed to do now. How would it be if I looked if I looked vulnerable by talking to them, by asking them what they think? You know, it's a fear of losing what I've got or the thing I don't know I'm going to get. Mm. Rex, random question. How do you get on with HR people? in my book final manuscript number 17 i thought i'd better write a disclaimer <laughs> at the front because i say hr is and i say this with respect but a fair bit of knowledge is the seat of disempowerment in a business if there's negativity happening in a business it will almost it will too often come from the HR environment. HR is an add-on. It used to be payroll. <laughs> you know, they did the payroll stuff and it used to be personnel. And then they put it all together and made it a 57-year uh, double degree uh, professorship, you know. And somewhere along the line, they forgot about people. And um, so my experience with HR is very, very poor. Uh, and in fact, a very dear friend of mine's son suicided recently. And uh, there's almost no doubt that uh, HR lost many opportunities at changing the culture that supported that environment. And so HR often put in unenviable positions, often not included in the executive group, uh, uh, often used to, often resourced for, for doing negative things and, and not, not being given a chance to be heard. But I don't know what it is about the HR courses and I taught advanced diploma in HR. Uh, not, I didn't teach the course, but I taught the subject. And um, people just, I don't know, it's at the heart of many things that are wrong mm. in business. And I say about professionals, <laughs> second, second, second time I did a final review of my book, added in another disclaimer, I say, if you think you need to go to see a professional, you probably don't even know the question to ask them. And they're probably going to give you the answer they give to most people who look like the, the person that you looked like when you walked in. And you're going to go away and do what they say because they're professionals. Well, 
mum and dad are going to want to talk to you, your best friend's going to want to talk to you. If you want to go and see a professional, go and see them. And what if you listen carefully, you're going to be hearing different conversations. Don't push the different conversations away. Listen to the conversations. Write down the comments they make because there's more questions in there. You need to get more questions happening in your mind before you can even get close to a solution because you're probably going to find a solution to the question that wasn't the right question. So if you go and see an accountant or, or, or a solicitor or an engineer or an architect or a professional, ask your question. And when they give you the answer, say thank you. And then say, let's do a pros and cons on your answer. And if they say no, shake their hand and go and find somebody else. If they say yes, do the pros and cons. When you've done that, say thank you. Now, let's look for another answer. Because it's only in the, in the Edward de Bono says, always look for three answers if it's a really important question. Always, because the first answer is just out of your head. The first answer is the habit. The first answer is spontaneous. You know, so get past spontaneous, get past your paradigm, and look for look look for new answers. So, always always pros and cons, and then another answer. And by then, you'll you'll work out the question you should have asked, and you'll be better off. So, for people who who are happy enough to still be here, <laughs> hello you too. <laughs> Uh, if you want to, if you want this, you just go on to the Develop Leadership Thinking webpage. And because of my uh, long association with Brendan and the culture of things, uh, I'm happy to give you half price. So that would be capital R E X fifty, and uh, we only charge you half price, so it's going to cost you fifteen bucks. And it's two hundred and ten pages. Thank you very of much. Always, stuff. always giving value, Rex. Love it. Thank <laughs> you very much, down. mate. And, and thank you very much for sharing your story. And obviously, quite emotional. And, and you know, sorry to hear about your your friend's uh, situation. Really sad to hear, mate. I've always got to be respectful of people's time. And we've been talking for about an hour or so. You spoke about at, right at the start of our conversation about your. Uh, backstory, 15 Woolworths and stuff like that. So I don't want you to use that example, but I always like to ask my guests, what's that one thing through your journey and your journey has been extensive that has had the greatest impact on your own leadership journey? Well, uh, it has to be the first five corporate companies. Before I, I left corporate life and uh, went out by myself, the first five people who were the managers weren't. They were absolutely wonderful leaders. And so I, I mentioned that none of the things I did in my first corporate position had I ever done before. So I, I didn't go up a ladder. I, I, I went across <laughs> scaffolding. And uh, so I, went, I, was, I, was, I was received into senior positions with no background. In my recruitment company, I would give a client people they asked for. I'd give a three month guarantee and I'd give them people that I believe were right for them. And I'll give them a year guarantee. And the people who I thought were right for them hardly ever had much in the way of background in the industry that I was putting them into. Because group think and preemptive think and command and control is so strong that new people get depreciated almost immediately by having to fit in to the culture. So I think from this little amoeba thing to where whatever I was at the end of my fifth corporate um, assignment was just sucking in the energy and, and the behaviour, not the words, the behaviour of these five absolutely amazing managing directors that I, that I, I had. Mm. Um, very, very lucky that you had who I am today. Uh, such good leaders to uh to look up to and learn from in an early start so fantastic mate yeah mate oh, thank yeah. you very much for what you shared today we've had i think uh, around five people uh that have been had taken some time to be on the live stream so thank you very much your comments have certainly resonated with those people uh on the you know, on the live stream and, and what they've said in the chat so they really appreciate mate i want to thank you for your time today um, as I said earlier, like res with the utmost respect, I love that, um, unfortunately, what I would call old style leadership, but I think 
more of that old style needs to be in the current and the new style of leadership, less about the shiny bells and stuff like that, more about, I guess, the biggest thing I took from you, which is a massive belief in that I have, is the ability to have those genuine conversations makes all the difference. So, mate, thank you once again. Thanks for your offer with the, with the book. We'll put yeah. all of these details into the show notes, how to contact Rex. Um, fantastic guy man of unbelievable experience, wealth of knowledge, mate. Thanks for sharing today. And thanks for being such a great guest on the Culture of Things podcast. I've got this little double-sided cheat sheet, uh, which has a lot of the actual tools you can use in the thinking I've been talking about. And that might even be another time we might, 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 might get to chat. But uh, that comes with the book as well. And so that's the thing you can put into your, on your desk and help you get away from the habit behaviours that we all have. Thank you, Brendan, for making it possible for me to speak. Fantastic, mate. Thank you once again. Pleasure having you. Yeah. All right. Bye, all. Rex is an old-style leader. He believes in connecting with people, building trust, challenging each other's thoughts, Asking questions, listening, asking more questions, listening, asking more questions, listening, and in doing so, building commitment to outcomes. New style leadership seems to be more about implementing the newest tool or following some newly marketed business model that takes hours to understand before you can even think about how to implement it in your business. What we need to understand is that old style leadership done well enables the intelligence of the individuals to work together and achieve greatness. Old style leadership is about focusing on the people and how they interact. For me, this is an old style leadership. It's the only form of leadership. These were my three key takeaways from my conversation with Rex. My first key takeaway, Leaders believe in your potential. The amazing thing is that as people, we meet expectations. If the expectation is low, we'll meet it. If the expectation is high, we'll meet it. We'll do everything in our power to meet it. Leaders believe in you and will support you to achieve your greatest potential. My second key takeaway, leaders build on the talents of everyone. They understand that each person can and should contribute to a solution. They ask questions, allow the person to speak and use that knowledge to build on what was said before. This process creates buy-in and commitment and a perpetual cycle of learning and building on each other's talents. My third key takeaway, leaders take responsibility for change. Whether it be helping someone move from a command and control style or providing feedback about behaviours that contributes or detracts from a team, they know they can have an impact and therefore take responsibility to initiate change. So in summary, my three key takeaways were, leaders believe in your potential, leaders build on the talents of everyone and leaders take responsibility for change. If you want to talk culture, leadership or teamwork or have any questions or feedback about the episode, leave me a comment on the socials or you can leave me a voice message at thecultureofthings.com. Thanks for joining me and remember, the best outcome is on the other side of a genuine conversation.